Welcome back to the YouTube channel. This is the Savage Fab Guy, Bradley Carter. Behind the camera is Dalton Carter. He does all the editing and all that stuff. So we left off with a really grand overview of the P700. And what we're gonna go over today in depth is the AFC, the Air Fuel Control Module that is located on the top rear side of the injection pump. I have it all ready to be disassembled. So I think we're just gonna get right into it and we're gonna go to the AFC. We have our entire P700 pump here again. Um, if you know, versus the last video, the VE pump versus the P pump, you can see just how much bigger this thing is. We can't talk about another one, but it's still just pretty nuts how large these pumps are. Uh, I'm not sure if I stated it in the other video, but these pumps were never designed originally to go on the trucks, the 94 to 98 trucks. I think they just kind of ran out of design time and ended up going with it just because it was available. Like, just made it work. This pump is way larger than it needs to be for a 5.9 liter engine. So the first thing on the AFC housings is to get them off. There's usually a tamper-proof screw if they have not been messed with uh, in this rear slot, I believe. And then there's more on the back side. The best way I found to get those out is the ones that are on top of the AFC housing is to find a Torx head that's really close or a Allen head that's really close and drive them in there. You can assist it by putting a little bit of a chamfer on it if you have like a sacrificial one that you can put a chamfer on, hammer it in, and take it out. The other way you could do it is to use a chisel and hit the top of the tamper proof with a chisel quite a few times to put a bevel in it, then you can use a flat blade screwdriver uh, to take them out. Usually that's the best way to do it when it's to get the housing off and then the other tamper proofs remove afterwards so then it can be on a bench vise. So the thread pitch on all these are M6 by one, nope, if I'm not mistaken. There's that bag over there that has them in there, but I'm pretty sure they're M6 by one oh. If you do have to replace any of these or get new ones, that's what the pitch is. So from here you can remove your AFC. So this guy right here controls all the fuel availability uh, per PSI. Underneath is a fuel plate which doesn't have holes in it. So from here there will be a camper proof in this one that we'll remove. And then once it's out, the best way I found to take the camper proofs out is just to use a set of vice grips. You can usually grab the edges of the camper proof screws uh, with the grips and get them out. It's a lot easier than, I mean you can if you want, use a cut off wheel or a grinder and put a slot in it and all that fun stuff. But there will be one to two here over a cover that's going to need to come off and one here. The rest of these will all be just normal flat blades. So before we get too far into what we have here, this setting on the back here is our pre-boost fuel. What this is connected to is the AFC foot. That might be a little bit hard to see in the video, but as we back this out, we notice the foot travels rearwards. And as we tighten it up, we see that the foot travels forwards. So what this setting is, is how, what the, basically, what's the resting position of the foot in relation to what will ride against it, which is this lever down inside of the pump itself. So if we had uh, this a little bit far forward, that means that when we want to, before there's any PSI in the system, we would have, say, this much fuel. Then after this point, the lever would st stop against the foot and any further progression of the throttle would not result in any more rack travel. This is all of your low boost fueling settings. So if you notice that if you don't have any boost pressure or at a low boost pressure, say sub 10 PSI, and you mat it and it's too smoky for you, what you can do is go in and adjust the setting in and out. And there's not a whole lot of tension on this. I mean, the tension is going to be varying on your star wheel setting, but in this instance, there's not a whole lot of tension on here. You can go quite a bit out. Uh, one of the things you can do, I mean, you can take this thing too so far back that it should not allow the truck to start. But 
you keep adjusting this back so when you mat it, if that's how you want your driving style to be, or if you say you use a, a quickly into a half throttle situation and you want it to burn cleaner, or only burn in a haze and right now it's heavy because you just put in some bigger injectors, you can take this guy and back it out. Almost always when we go up in injector size, this needs to get backed out. So what'll happen a lot of the times is on a stock injector truck, we will actually turn this in because the stock injector provides so little fueling, we can increase what's available when boost is low and it'll still run clean or it'll at a, like a light to medium haze. And as soon as we put in a set of injectors, all of a sudden it's dirty. So in that case, we would back it out. The other case where we would back it out is if the turbocharger got larger. And not necessarily the frame got larger, but the flow capacity of the turbo got uh, higher. If the flow capacity of the turbo goes up, then we know the turbo's gonna spool a little bit slower. And in that case, we're usually gonna back this guy out to, de to decrease the amount of fuel available at low, low boost pressures because it's gonna take a little longer to come on. And we're trying to clean up that bottom end. Oh, sit down. So, this is our, you can actually adjust the star wheel on the truck. Maybe we'll do that towards the end here. So that's how that works. And what you might be wondering is what does that adjust? If we take these guys out. Okay, so underneath this is a diaphragm. <clears throat> that's kind of, I've never seen one with a uh, plastic nut on there before like that. So pretty neat. Low horsepower. <laughs> this is a 160 pump, so it might only be a 160 pump thing. This housing can be oriented however you want it to be. So just like on the VE pump top, where you could we could rotate it 180. This one can rotate in 90 degree increments, depending on your application setup. Sometimes having the boost port towards the head might not be how you want to run your line. So you can turn this around. There's nothing in here that has um, indexing marks for it to only go a certain way. What can happen though sometimes is these diaphragms can get a tear in them. And when they get a tear in them, <clears throat> they won't work properly. So when they get a tear, you're pre-boost setting won't work and you'll be bleeding boost pressure to the inside of the pump which will then bleed it to the inside of your crankcase which is uh, never a good thing. They do now I believe sell replacement uh, diaphragms, nuts, the washers and all that stuff and if you're going to do a max travel kit from power driven diesel you're going to be getting into here or if you're going to change out the spring that's underneath. then you would need to uh, to do that. I'll take that out. We can show you how to disassemble this. I mean, it's not too, what you do is you, this here has to come out. So this rod here, this, so there's this, this rod that the foot slides on, will come out this front door. It's actually connected to this plate right here. Then once you do that, the foot can go, I want to say it's up over the top of this and out and this here can pull out of its housing. So this is oily and messy, and so what we're probably going to do is throw this back, cap back on. But you can see the spring underneath there, that's what we're adjusting with the star wheel. So there's a threaded portion in this housing that has a cog on it, or an adjusting nut that adjusts the pretension on that wheel. And we can see that as boost pressure comes up, it pushes this forward. As that gets pushed forward, there's more rack travel available to use. So it's either going to be available to use if the boost pressure is ahead of what we're asking the pump to supply fuel-wise, or if we're just flat footing it, this is our fuel rate curve over time. As the boost pressure comes up, with the engine RPM increasing, we're gonna this is gonna move forward and it's gonna allow the rack to travel forward and that the same linear progression as the boost rise. Now uh, that's back on there, we can take a look underneath. That's just a big Allen. You can get to it if you take off the uh, six injector line, injector line separator or isolator, or whatever you want to call it. You can put a big Allen down in there and with uh, another wrench, pop it open. So down inside here, I'm not sure if we can see this, but we can see the spring. And then this direction up at the front is the cog adjuster. 
or nut adjuster, I don't see it. But that's called the star, everybody calls that the star wheel. And how you normally adjust them is just with a smaller flat blade screwdriver, you can stick it down in there and rotate it. Now, adjusting the star wheel tighter will mean it's gonna take more boost pressure per millimeter of rack travel. So if we make this tighter, it's gonna take longer to get to full rack. If we make it looser, we can get the full rack sooner. So as an example, a lot of the pumps, you can set these things so loose that they will have full rack travel available within five to seven pounds of boost. Generally on a stock injector truck, that is not a, uh, a problem. When you put big injectors in or a slower spooling turbocharger, that's where it starts to cause issues, heavy oil fueling, and in a lot of cases, torque loss and spool up loss because it's too much fuel too soon with too cool of a uh, compression event. What we found in a lot of cases with stuff that has at least like a 5x14 or say a 100 horsepower or more injector is that using a air compressor and setting this to full rack travel, so this one it'll go to full rack at about 20 to 22 psi, works really well. From that point, you could do fine adjustments up or down, and you can do that for trucks that do make over 60 pounds of boost, because usually by the time you're at 20 to 30 pounds of boost, it's gonna go really quickly all the way up to whatever your peak number is, from 50 to 100 plus if it's a compound setup. Um, so that it ramps through that so fast that it doesn't really become necessary to have different kinds of springs. Now, if you're going to be operating, say, consistently at a 40 PSI plus with, like, say, a compound arrangement where it normally sits in those areas, then going with a stiffer spring is helpful. The big thing you want to make sure of, though, is not to run a stiffer spring in here that you can't obtain pressure-wise. So, if, say, your max boost pressure is 43 PSI, and you put a spring in here that's rated at 46, then you'll never actually see full rack and if you put it on a chassis dyno we won't see full power if you go compete you're not going to see full power so if the only spring available was a 35 then we would put a 35 spring in knowing the thing's going to make 43 psi but that's the best choice seeing as the next size up is a 46 psi spring same with they make like a 60 and a higher setups like that so Baseline, use it using an air compressor to fine tune this one. You can note it in on a notepad or on a on your cell phone. You can note where you had set it and what it had done, and then make an adjustment and say you can go check it with the compressor again if you want to, or at least get a base starting point at 20 psi for full rack and then make adjustments from there. The faster the turbo spools, usually the looser you can have this. The slower the turbo spools, this typically tends to be on the tighter side. The big thing you don't want to do is go so tight that we lose travel here. So whenever we're testing these, we want to make sure that they are going, that this part of the AFC bottoms out against the housing. That's going to allow for full rack travel. Some of the tricks you can do, but be very, very careful while doing them, is one, to shave this foot flat. That'll gain you probably three millimeters of rack travel. The thing you can do is take 0.100 off this part of the AFC foot. Remember, you can't put it back on unless you have a welder and a lathe. So just keep that in mind when taking material off here. You can take too much. If you take too much, it'll allow the rack to travel too far. It'll fall out of the guide, lock it, and it'll be stuck at wide open throttle. There is no way to shut the truck off without a way to block the turbocharger, a guillotine, or something solid enough to do so, or a fuel diverter valve, which would then divert all fuel back to the tank instead of feeding it to the injection pump. Those are the only two ways to shut the truck off. So it can be very dangerous while doing these kinds of mods. So usually what we kind of do is, unless you feel you need those mods, you're probably better off leaving it alone for now. Or if you're comfortable, say, wrecking an engine, an injection pump, or a vehicle, then go ahead and give it a try. But just know that crazy stuff can happen. No more than 0.100 of an inch, 0.1. And you can take this flat. Realistically, you don't really need to take that flat if you don't want to. Just do the mod here. It's a safe one. 
the other thing that you can do too is they have different washer mods. You can get a, the easiest way honestly to do this is to use a PDD Max Rack Travel Kit. The only different thing that even with a Rack Travel Kit or an AFC Live or Tuner is that we recommend that you leave um, the plate in. I think the Attitude Adjuster is the only one that really feels safe taking the plate out and that's because the Attitude Adjuster directly attaches to this, but even still having the plate in there is a nice safety precaution. It does not hurt to have a plate in. Once you have the plate, you can shave it flat to a number zero and just set it all the way at its full travel. The other adjustment that's a very crude adjustment on the AFC housing are these slots. The slots do the exact same thing as the pre-boost setting. So if you see that you have the pre-boost all the way back and it's still too smoky, the next thing to do is you can go ahead and start to slide the housing backwards. Because even with this all the way rearward, but the housing all the way in the forward spot, that can typically lead to still having a fair amount of zero boost rack travel available. So that's a very coarse adjustment. From there, you make your fine adjustment. On a lot of the cases, we just start with everything kind of at the maxed out state. So the housing's all the way forward. Typically, we'll add some turns in on pre-boost. Uh, we will loosen the star wheel up a little bit, or at least check it with the air compressor method and set it to around 18 to 22 PSI for full rack available. And then from there, go start making dyno runs. Typically, from the maxed effort point of view, Unless it's smoke on the bottom end, so like a bigger turbocharger, usually this is going to stay full forward. Uh, what will happen is we will start to back out the pre-boost to get the start into run area cleaner. And a lot of cases when we do get it cleaner, say from a heavy smoke to a, lot, a medium smoke condition, we will pick up torque and horsepower from that start of run to the mid part of the run. Um, from mid part of the run to the top end of the run, seems to be more dictated by uh, the injector quality, uh, boost pressure, the, how much you're intercooling, um, and other factors like that. Uh, so mainly a lot of this tuning is for your off idle to mid range. I think that about covers it. This slaughtered area, if anybody's asked about the slaughtered area, what the slaughtered area does is it's cammed over on this rod here. So it just changes that's why this actually has an angle on it. This is a very fine, very fine adjustment. So you would do this after you have done this, 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 you would get to this point. This is a very fine adjustment and that's why this is tapered. If this was not tapered, this would uh, no longer do anything. So that's like you can, if you want like a real fine adjustment, don't grind this flat, leave it how it is. And what this does is it allows you to choose which part of the taper you're on. That's a very fine adjustment. It, we haven't seen it on the dyno grind this flat make any difference. The big one is taking 100 off of here and doing the shim kit on the diaphragm. What the shim kit on the diaphragm may be doing as well is just making sure basically this is taking away this from being the stop and the shim kit is now the stop because the shim kit would bottom out against um, its system. or the spring is bottoming out and they know it's a safe distance for you to go. So you don't necessarily have to grind that one flat if you don't want to, it's an extra step. That's what this adjustment here is for. It changes what part on this taper you are on as far as what part of the foot or the lever inside of the pump is pushing. So as far as AFC tuning, I think we've about covered it think of anything else just yet. The next thing, plate position, go to plate position in the next video, and maybe in the delivery valves and how those work, and the governor's work. Sounds like fun. I think that about covers it when I'm going over the AFC on the P700. I thought maybe we draw a quick example. So what we're doing is there's a throttle lever a little bit like that inside the pump and you have your AFC foot which comes down like so 
So what the pre-boost does, because it's connected on a, a slot right here with the diaphragm, and then the adjustment screw, is what the adjustment screw does is it changes the distance between these two points. I can't tell you what the factory CCs are at zero boosts, but usually when you get a pump benched and flowed and returned to you from a injection pump shop, it'll have a CCs at zero PSI. So in the case of the pump that's on my truck, it's 110 CCs at zero PSI. So what that number is, is if I stomp on it at zero pounds of boost and my throttle lever goes forward and then contacts the AFC foot, the most amount of fuel I can put in in one minute per one plunger is 110 cc's. So without any boost pressure to push the diaphragm further, that's all you get. If, 100, if I was on a, a bigger set of injectors and I found that to be too much, I could back this out. Now I don't know what it would be when I back it out, but I know it's gonna be less than 110 cc's. And if I felt like my system could take more, it's compound turbos or hitting with nitrous right off the hit, then I could push this in move the foot further this direction. So instead of 100, instead of this distance equaling 110, this distance could now equal 170 before any uh, boost was introduced. If I found that 110 was too much, like I said, we can back the screw out, move the foot closer to the lever, which means I'll have say 80 cc's and now I'm waiting for boost to come up to move this. So, and if 22 psi was where I set max rack travel at, then I would know that at 22 psi, my pump is now moving 390 cc's. So at zero psi, I have 110. And at 20 psi, I have 390 available to use. So the catch 22 is, is that if the turbo stays ahead of our fuel curve, we can actually have the boost pressure move the foot further away, but our foot might be back here. So if the foot was to be, at, say at 22 PSI, the foot's all the way out of the way, so I have 390 cc's available, but I only have my throttle position at half throttle, then I would only be using, say, around 250 cc's but at any point in time, I could stomp on it and I would not have to wait for the foot to get out of the way. The foot's already out of the way and I would instantly go from 250 cc's a minute to 390 cc's a minute. So this is fine for those that drive very observant of what's going on. If you just want to be able to mat it and let the AFC controller do its thing for you, what would happen is you would mat it. You'd mat it. The throttle lever would push against here. I uh, sorry, the yeah the internal throttle lever here. You would stretch a spring mechanism out so your foot. I'm gonna draw a throttle. A little foot. You can mat it down. It'll pull a spring apart, and now that there's that spring tension there. As the boost pressure comes up, and this incrementally moves this direction, 5 PSI, 10 PSI, 15 PSI, 20 PSI, this, because it's contacting the foot, would just progressively travel its way down following it. And that's an AFC control, air fuel control. Doing it all on its own. Basically, it's a mechanical computer that does all the work for you, so you can just pin it, and then the AFC does the work for you. If you're ever in a situation where you don't want to wait on the AFC to do it for you and you might want more torque available, you can set the star wheel a little looser than normal or you can set the pre-boost a little bit farther in if you're going with stuff closer from low, low range to mid range. Typically though what happens is we kind of get the thing dialed where you can mat it and it does everything it's supposed to do and then you can loosen the star wheel up a little bit in case you get into a situation where you might need a little bit more torque production than what the AFC is allowing you to have but if you're more of a just stomp on it and go and not want to worry about anything then you could do all of that right here with the system.
So it's all there for you to use. It's all built into the injection pump. It comes with everything you need to tune it however you want to tune it. Like the big thing, I guess, is some people will say, um, oh, that would be a good explanation. An AFC controller fixed my EGTs while towing. Well, the AFC controller didn't really fix your EGTs while towing. What an AFC controller did, an external one, like AFC Live or the Attitude Adjuster. So the Attitude Adjuster moves this back and forth, and then AFC Live limits how much pressure can go into this side, limiting how far that can go. It did the exact same thing as you just lifting your foot up a little farther. But you don't have to like think about it is really what it comes down to. And it's an in-cab adjuster, which is really nice. Adjusting on the pump can take anywhere from four to six hours just to get it dialed for one scenario. A, uh, a tractor pull, a drag race, or street use. All three of those tunes are gonna be different and having an in-cab adjuster with notes so you can get to each one of those tunes can be helpful if you're doing all three of those things or a tow tune, but you're not really gonna have a, a miles per gallon tune per se. You could call it a miles per gallon tune when in all reality you're just limiting the pressure inside of the AFC housing so it limits how much horsepower you can use. And if, from our previous videos, horsepower is fuel burn hour. So work done hour. And all the BTUs tell the fuel. So if we limit the fuel, we limit the power produced. And if we limit the power produced, the miles per gallons tend to go up. So all that works. So all the tools, like I said, are available to you on the injection pump, but it can take a lot of driving and working around a hot engine to do it. A external controller, such as an attitude adjuster uh, or PD's ASC Live, makes it to where you don't have to stop, make adjustments, and then go. You can just make adjustments while driving, which is really nice but don't mistake a controller for something that couldn't have been done um, not on the pump. It's all there for you to use. It just takes more work. So, if, like I said, if, the, if everything stays the same and the EGTs went down, it's because we reduced where the racks was position is. We reduced the fuel and we reduced power. We didn't get lower EGTs from a tuner because of the tuner when it just, and this comes from the mechanical stuff, not from common rails and BPs. The EGTs went down because we reduced the fuel in the system. The way we reduced the fuel in the system is we either used an attitude adjuster, which is connected to the foot, and pulled the foot back. So we pulled the rack back, reduced CCs, or we limited pressure in the AFC housing behind the diaphragm, which would not allow the foot to travel as far, or if, say, you had the diaphragm set up high at 50 psi and then you turned it down to 30 this is coming backwards reducing cc's which would also reduce egt's but when you reduce cc's you also reduce power that's how it works there's no way around it it's just the name of the game unless the brake specific changed then the power was reduced that's how that works they're really handy for times that you just don't want to have to worry about stuff or you're working at different elevations, different tracks, different conditions, where you're doing to make changes on the fly quickly. I really like the attitude adjuster when it comes to limiting the horsepower in a limited turbo class. So we pull and work stock, so we can only have a certain size turbocharger. We have a pump that moves more than a thousand cc's, but there's no reason to try to push a thousand cc's through a turbo that it can only supply enough air to burn 800 cc's. So there's where the attitude adjuster would come in handy is you can turn it down, or if you're racing like a 670 index or a uh, 7, is it 770? Apologize if I got that wrong. Uh, class, you can use the attitude adjuster to set your rack position, max rack position, to only make enough horsepower to run as close to that ET as possible. And, and you can do the exact same thing with the ASC Live. The nice thing with the ASC Live is the attitude adjuster only adjusts max fueling position and then the rest is still done by you on the AFC and the previous. With the PD's AFC Live, you loosen most of these settings up. Other than the pre-boost, the pre-boost you still have to set up on, a, on the AFC Live. There's no way around that. Um, but with AFC Live, you don't have to do really much of anything but the star wheel. So all of the things that once boost pressure is coming up, all of those adjustments are done on the PD 
AFC Live itself. So you can control the ramp rate of the fuel. Basically, you can control uh, how far does the foot travel per pound of boost. And you can dial in cleanliness and your speed by, say, only letting the, if you have like, and the spring doesn't need to be higher. So if you have like a, a 40 pound spring in here or you have the stock 20 pound spring and you only want it to go to 70% of that because only going to 70% of that would allow you to run the time you're trying to run consistently without having to think about it, bracket racing. Sorry, but that's, bracket racing feels a lot like that a lot of the times. You're trying to run as close to the time as you can every single time. Um, so, versus heads up style racing, not knocking on anybody. We're gonna go race. Uh, we don't have an eighth mile track. We well, they do have, they have 760 or something. We're probably gonna be in the 770 class or 760 class. 790 whatever that number is um, and we're going to be in that class so knocking it while also being, being in it because uh, it's fun uh, i think that goes over everything so the only things to remember is to like subscribe and comment on this video if we missed anything or you liked what was in it let us know the other thing not to forget about is instaschoolperformance.com that's where you can get this really cool shirt that Dalton Carter designed using one of our own turbochargers. And you saw in the other video, and now this one, the new hats. They are snapback, so you don't get a headache. New trend is a label on one side. Uh, we got the American flag and SF fabrication on the back, so you know what the SF is. It's not San Francisco. <laughs> uh, so they're really comfy, they're really awesome been wearing mine every time I go out anywhere so check those out that swag allows us to make more swag and cool stuff you also if you do a hat you get two free stickers that's a ten dollar value right there so it makes it uh, makes it work it's not as bad on the shipping costs I know shipping these things kind of sucks but I don't own UPS so it is what it is <laughs> I really hope you guys enjoyed this one on the next video the governor springs and the delivery valves so we can go over how the holder works why you don't need a 120 holder uh, or a big drilled out holder after talking to quite a few pump guys it's it's realistically dumb unless you're training a lot of rpms and most of us aren't turning a lot of rpms most of us are all operating below 4,000 rpms so in that case the stock holder will do everything that we want it to do and the governor springs we will go over really easy how to set them up and get them right almost every single time the first time without any problems all it takes is a dial caliper and a flat blade screwdriver and a magnet it's just a small magnet not a big one and you can get those things dialed in every single time without any issues and also what you can do with a governor spring stack as far as the adjustment goes to get more or less out of it and what you will notice when you do the different adjustments on the governor spring as far as the setting on the adjuster and that. So, thank you again for watching. Have a good day.